Lesson 12 Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom Sabbath Afternoon March 12 God is speaking to us in these last days. We hear His voice in the storm, in the rolling thunder. We hear of calamities He permits in the earthquakes, the breaking forth of waters, and the destructive elements sweeping all before them. In these perilous times, those who profess to be God's commandment-keeping people should guard against the tendency to lose the spirit of reverence and godly fear. The scriptures teach men how to approach their Maker, with humility and awe, through faith in a divine mediator. Let man come on bended knee, as a subject of grace, a suppliant at the footstool of mercy. Thus he is to testify that the whole soul, body, and spirit are in subjection to his Creator. God's Amazing Grace, page 91 An earthquake marked the hour when Christ laid down his life, and another earthquake witnessed the moment when he took it up in triumph. He who had vanquished death and the grave came forth from the tomb with the tread of a conqueror amid the reeling of the earth, the flashing of lightning, and the roaring of thunder. When he shall come to the earth again, he will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage. The heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 26, Isaiah chapter 24 verse 20, and chapter 34 verse 4, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10, and Joel chapter 3 verse 16. The Desire of Ages Page 780. Those who study the Bible, counsel with God, and rely upon Christ will be enabled to act wisely at all times and under all circumstances. Good principles will be illustrated in actual life. Only let the truth for this time be cordially received and become the basis of character, and it will produce steadfastness of purpose, which the allurements of pleasure, the fickleness of custom, the contempt of the world-loving, and the heart's own clamors for self-indulgence are powerless to influence. Conscience must be first enlightened, the will must be brought into subjection. The love of truth and righteousness must reign in the soul, and a character will appear which heaven can approve. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, Page 43 Sunday, March 13. You have come to Mount Zion. Jesus is coming in the glory of the Father and with all the retinue of holy angels to escort him on his way to earth. All heaven will be emptied of the angels while the waiting saints will be looking for him and gazing into heaven, as were the men of Galilee when he ascended from the Mount of Olivet. Then only those who are holy, those who have followed fully the meek pattern, will with rapturous joy exclaim as they behold him, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. And they will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. That trump which wakes the sleeping saints and calls them forth from their dusty beds, clothed with glorious immortality, and shouting, Victory! Victory over death and the grave! The chained saints are then caught up together with the angels to meet the Lord in the air, never more to be separated from the object of their love. With such a prospect as this before us, such a glorious hope, such a redemption that Christ has purchased for us by his own blood, shall we hold our peace? Shall we not praise God even with a loud voice, as did the disciples when Jesus rode into Jerusalem? Is not our prospect far more glorious than was theirs? 
who dare then forbid us glorifying God even with a loud voice when we have such a hope, big with immortality and full of glory? We have tasted of the powers of the world to come and long for more. My whole being cries out after the living God, and I shall not be satisfied until I am filled with all his fullness. Early Writings, page 110. Even here Christians may have the joy of communion with Christ. They may have the light of his love, the perpetual comfort of his presence. Every step in life may bring us closer to Jesus, may give us a deeper experience of his love, and may bring us one step nearer to the blessed home of peace. Then let us not cast away our confidence, but have firm assurance, firmer than ever before. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us, and he will help us to the end. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Let us look to the monumental pillars, reminders of what the Lord has done to comfort us and to save us from the hand of the destroyer. Let us keep fresh in our memory all the tender mercies that God has shown us, the tears he has wiped away, the pains he has soothed, the anxieties removed, the fears dispelled, the wants supplied, the blessings bestowed thus strengthening ourselves for all that is before us through the remainder of our pilgrimage. And by and by, the gates of heaven will be thrown open to admit God's children, and from the lips of the King of glory, the benediction will fall on their ears like richest music. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 Steps to Christ pages 125 and 126. Monday, March 14. You have come to God, the judge of all. The gospel message proclaimed by Christ's disciples pointed forward to his second coming in glory to redeem his people, and it set before men the hope through faith and obedience, of sharing the inheritance of the saints in light. This message is given to men today, and at this time there is coupled with it the announcement of Christ's second coming as at hand. The signs which he himself gave of his coming have been fulfilled, and by the teaching of God's word we may know that the Lord is at the door. John in the Revelation foretells the proclamation of the gospel message just before Christ's second coming. He beholds an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 and 7. In the prophecy, this warning of the judgment, with its connected messages, is followed by the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. The proclamation of the judgment is an announcement of Christ's second coming as at hand, and this proclamation is called the everlasting gospel. Thus the preaching of Christ's second coming, the announcement of its nearness, is shown to be an essential part of the gospel message. Christ's Object Lessons Pages 226 to 228. John saw the mercy, the tenderness, and the love of God blending with his holiness, justice, and power. He saw sinners finding a father in him of whom their sins had made them afraid. And looking beyond the culmination of the great conflict, he beheld upon Zion them that had gotten the victory stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God, and singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. The Savior is presented before John under the symbols of the Lion of the tribe of Judah and of a Lamb as it had been slain. Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. These symbols represent the union of omnipotent power and self-sacrificing love. The Lion of Judah, so terrible to the rejecters of His grace, will be the Lamb of God to the obedient and faithful. 
the pillar of fire that speaks terror and wrath to the transgressor of God's law, is a token of light and mercy and deliverance to those who have kept his commandments. The arm strong to smite the rebellious will be strong to deliver the loyal. Everyone who is faithful will be saved. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 589 and 590. Tuesday, March 15. Shake the Heavens and the Earth On December 16, 1848, the Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. I saw that when the Lord said heaven, in giving the signs recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he meant heaven, and when he said earth, he meant earth. The powers of heaven are the sun, moon, and stars. They rule in the heavens. The powers of earth are those that rule on the earth. The powers of heaven will be shaken at the voice of God. Then the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. Dark heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken and that events come in order. War and rumors of war, sword, famine, and pestilence are first to shake the powers of earth. Then the voice of God will shake the sun, moon, and stars, and this earth also. Early Writings, page 41. It will not be long until the gathering storm will burst upon the world that is so asleep in sin. When the earth is reeling to and fro like a drunkard, when the heavens are shaking, and the great day of the Lord has come, who shall be able to stand? One object they behold in trembling agony from which they will try in vain to escape. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. That Lamb whose wrath will be so terrible to the scorners of His grace will be grace and righteousness and love and blessing to all who have received Him. The pillar of cloud that was dark with terror and avenging wrath to the Egyptians was to the people of God a pillar of fire for brightness. So will it be to the Lord's people in these last days. The light and glory of God to His commandment-keeping people are darkness to the unbelieving. They see that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The arm long stretched, strong to save all who come unto him, is strong to execute his judgment upon all who would not come unto him that they might have life. God grant that while mercy still lingers, while the voice of invitation is still heard, there will be a turning unto the Lord. The sure provision has been made to shelter every soul and shield those who have kept his commandments until the indignation be overpassed. That I may know him, page 356. In mercy to the world, God blotted out its wicked inhabitants in Noah's time. In mercy, he destroyed the corrupt dwellers in Sodom. Through the deceptive power of Satan, the workers of iniquity obtain sympathy and admiration and are thus constantly leading others to rebellion. It was so in Cain's and in Noah's day, and in the time of Abraham and Lot. It is so in our time. It is in mercy to the universe that God will finally destroy the rejecters of His grace. The Great Controversy, page 543. Wednesday, March 16, An Unshakable Kingdom The follower of Christ will meet with spiritualistic interpretations of the scriptures, but he is not to accept them. His voice is to be heard in clear affirmation of the eternal truths of the scriptures. Keeping his eyes fixed on Christ, 
he is to move steadily forward in the path marked out, discarding all ideas that are not in harmony with his teaching. The truth of God is to be the subject for his contemplation and meditation. He is to regard the Bible as the voice of God speaking directly to him. Thus he will find the wisdom which is divine. The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. This is the knowledge that works transformation of character. Received into the life, it will recreate the soul in the image of Christ. This is the knowledge that God invites His children to receive, beside which all else is vanity and nothingness. In every generation and in every land, the true foundation for character building has been the same, the principles contained in the Word of God. The only safe and sure rule is to do what God says. The statutes of the Lord are right, and he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Psalms 19, verse 8, and 15, verse 5. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 474 and 475. Those who are partakers of the divine nature will not give way to temptation. The enemy is working with all his might to overcome those who are striving to live the Christian life. He comes to them with temptations in the hope that they will yield. Thus he hopes to discourage them. But those who have planted their feet firmly on the rock of ages will not yield to his devices. They will remember that God is their Father and Christ their Helper. The Savior came to our world to bring to every tried, tempted soul strength to overcome even as He overcame. I know the power of temptation. I know the dangers that are in the way. But I know, too, that strength sufficient for every time of need is provided for those who are struggling against temptation. Messages to Young People, page 81 He that is to come says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Every good deed done by the people of God as the fruit of their faith will have its corresponding reward. As one star differeth from another star in glory, so will believers have their different spheres assigned them in the future life. When a man dies, his influence does not die with him, but it lives on, reproducing itself. The influence of the man who was good and pure and holy lives on after his death, like the glow of the descending sun, casting its glories athwart the heavens, lighting up the mountain peaks long after the sun has sunk behind the hill. So will the works of the pure and the holy and the good reflect their light when they no longer live to speak and act themselves. Their works, their words, their example will forever live. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, pages 428 and 429. Thursday, March 17. Let us be grateful. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. The Christian is to be prepared for the doing of a work that reveals kindness, forbearance, long-suffering, gentleness, patience. The cultivation of these precious gifts is to come into the life of the Christian that, when called into service by the Master, he may be ready to use his highest powers in helping and blessing those around him. In Heavenly Places, page 330. There are many who profess to be Christ's followers and yet are not doers of his word. They do not relish this word because it presents service which is not agreeable to them. The essence and flavor of all obedience is the outworking of a principle within, the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer, doing right because it is right. When the love of Christ enters the heart, we strive to imitate the character of Christ. The more we study the life of Christ with a heart to learn, the more Christ-like we become.
Into the heart of every true doer of the Word, the Holy Spirit infuses clear understanding. The more we crucify selfish practices by imparting our blessings to others and by exercising our God-given ability, the more the heavenly graces will be strengthened and increased in us. We will grow in spirituality, in patience, in fortitude, in meekness, in gentleness. That I May Know Him, page 118. Our God is a tender, merciful Father. His service should not be looked upon as a heart-saddening, distressing exercise. It should be a pleasure to worship the Lord and to take part in His work. God would not have His children, for whom so great salvation has been provided, act as if He were a hard, exacting taskmaster. He is their best friend, and when they worship Him, He expects to be with them, to bless and comfort them, filling their hearts with joy and love. The Lord desires His children to take comfort in His service and to find more pleasure than hardship in His work. He desires that those who come to worship Him shall carry away with them precious thoughts of His care and love, that they may be cheered in all the employments of daily life, that they may have grace to deal honestly and faithfully in all things. The soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshipped with song and music in the courts above. And as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly hosts. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth God. Psalm 50, verse 23. Let us with reverent joy come before our Creator with thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 3. Steps to Christ, pages 103 and 104. For further reading, The Faith I Live By, Unmoved in the Shaking Time, page 336, and Early Writings, The Shaking, pages 269 to 272.